welcome to this first video in the new Cubase Guru Synthesis course. This initial video is going to give you an oversight as to what's to come in the first section, which is the basics. It'll explain some principles to you. It'll also make you aware of some important issues that you need to be aware of when watching the video course. So please um, pay particular attention to this section of the course. If you have to make a note of anything, make a note of it. But please do pay special attention because there is some things in this part of the course that you need to know. Also, as a side note to that, please don't think that this section is about explaining in-depth anything. It's not. This is an overview. This will tell you some information that you need to know for this section of the course. Remember, it is just the first section. It is the basics. Everything that's mentioned in this section of the course will be explained, described and shown in much finer detail further on in the course. So, without th further ado, let's go on with it. Okay, something I want to make you aware of initially is a thing called the audio path. And basically what it explains is the three, is the three main elements of synthesis, which are the sound generators, your filter, and your amplifier. This process of a sound generator sending a signal to a filter, the filter then working on the sound source or the, the original sound that was generated and then that sound being sent on to the amplifier. This is the basic process of subtractive synthesis. There are many more other types of synthesis including FM synthesis, additive, granular, wavetable. However, this is the best place to start because it makes it very easy for you to understand the basic principles of what we're going into. Okay, so the first section, sound generator. Now a sound generator can be many things. Oscillators. An oscillator is a, is a device that creates an audio wave, whether it be a sine wave, a saw wave, noise, square wave, triangle wave. There's many different types of waves, of which I'll show you in a moment. A sound generator can also be a sampler, a sample of a more complex waveform, a sample of your voice, a drum. Any of these can be sound generators. Anything that generates a sound that can then be manipulated by the filter is a sound generator. A filter is a device that you use to shape the sound that you send from the sound generator. In subtractive synthesis, the filter filters out frequencies or harmonics from the sound source or removes sounds from the sound source, hence the name subtractive synthesis, and shapes that sound to be something else. So you can think of the filter as a tone shaping device. Once you've then passed it through the filter, it then gets passed on to the amplifier, which is in its most basic form, a level control. Makes things louder, makes things quieter. However, it can do more than that, especially when you add in things like an envelope that controls the amp. But we'll get into that again much later on. Okay, sound generators. In this instance, this is Rob Paben's Predator. This is a fixed architecture synthesizer, which is explained further on in this video. I'm just going to put it to the default preset. Okay, as you can see, we've changed it to default. So just left click in there, come down here. Now, what that means is it's only playing this one oscillator and as you can see it says sine. Now if I move this up here, I shall show you what a sine wave looks like. There you go. There's your sine wave. Now that is a sound that was generated by an oscillator. So as we were saying earlier on, that is a sound source. Another type that an oscillator can supply are saw waves. And there you have your saw wave. Very easy to understand why it's called a saw wave. As you can see, it looks like the teeth on a saw. Very simple. Now again, I'm not going into a huge description of these because they will be explained in detail further on in the course. Another one of your more common waves is your square wave. 
as you can see we've got a square going on there a square wave also has another type of waveform called um, a pulse wave this is basically when you can move the width of the square wave so well, for instance in this case it's done by this dial here now I'm not sure how well this is going to look on here as you can see it's changing the width's changing because I'm using the pulse width modulation but again don't worry about that it's just I just mentioned that because it is another form of a square wave sometimes found in synths okay the next one is your triangle wave and I'm pretty sure you can guess what this will look like there you have it perfect triangle and the last one I'll show you is noise there we go and there's your noise so that's your five basic sound generators from an oscillator I'm not going to go into samplers and stuff like that again because this is a synthesis course so we'll leave it at that okay the next section I wanted to speak to you about was the filter now it does exactly what it says on the tin it filters out sounds from the sound source so to give you a brief example of that I'll let you hear that so this is the saw wave and what I'll do is I'll use the cutoff to cut out some of the frequencies of that saw wave Now this is a filter that is most basic. It also has an envelope which you can then use to shape the tone. And you have different types of filters. You have the low pass, high pass, band pass, notch and comb filters. These will all be explained in detail further on. But I just want to show you what that looks like when you filter some sound from a saw wave. Now here's your saw wave. Now watch what happens. <laughs> Notice the rounding of the wave. So as you can see, the, the shape of the saw has been rounded off. We are shaping or creating a different tone using the filter. So that's what your filters are used for at their most basic level. It's a tone shaping device. And lastly is the amp section, which for the purposes of this video, are it's very self-explanatory. We are only looking at it as a volume control. So if I turn that back up. So its most basic function, it is a volume control. However, as I did mention, when they've got their own envelope, which it has here, it can be used to create more tonal effects and a deeper level of control over the amplitude of a sound however again it's something we'll get into in more detail further on in the course okay let's move on to the next section then okay the next section is in relation to modulation the modulation can be explained by looking at a modulation source and a modulation destination now, modulation basically means to affect one parameter with something else, to modulate it, to move the sound, not necessarily the sound, but to move a certain parameter to create an outcome. Now, the easiest way to show this is by using a modulation matrix. Now, here we have a simple a preset in Zebra 2. If you like, I can even show you the the wave type, the waveform as we're doing this. So if I put that there. So yeah, okay, we've got our saw wave there. Now, what I want to do is modulate the oscillator's tuning with an LFO. Now, to do that, we come down here and click on Modulation Matrix. And we have this little section here. We have the target. So the target is 
what we would call the modulation destination. And in this case, it's the oscillator tuning. So we click in there, go to oscillator one and hit tune. Here we have the modulator or the modulation source. And in this case, we're going to use the modulation wheel on my MIDI controller. So what we do is we right click on the modulator, select modulation wheel. And if I now move the modulation wheel, if I move that up a little bit, now, if I move the modulation wheel, listen to what happens. Okay, so that's me using the modulation wheel to modulate the oscillator one tuning. Again, this will all be explained in more detail further on. Okay, some types of modulation sources are things like LFOs. You can use an LFO to modulate a parameter of something. So for instance, let's use LFO one here to modulate the cutoff frequency of the filter. So what have we got at the moment? So we'll just take this here, right click on that, and select LFO1. And as you can hear, LFO1's settings are now modulating the filter cutoff. So LFO1 being the source, the cutoff being the destination. Another type of internal modulation source, as we could call these. The reason I call them internal is because they're um, part of the internal makeup of the synth. They're part of the synthesizer, whereas an external modulation source would be something like the modulation wheel that I demonstrated earlier, or velocity, or maybe the pitch bend wheel. But another internal source could be an envelope. For instance, we've got envelope 2 here. If I come over here and select envelope 2, Put the attack right up. Bring the attack down, the decay down, the sustain, and the, as you can hear, there's nothing happening now. It's nice and so these that's that's an, an example of internal modulation sources, which I can just show you here. So an internal modulation source, something like an LFO in an envelope. External modulation sources are something like the pitch bend wheel, the modulation wheel on your MIDI controller, and also things like velocity, whereas velocity being how hard you hit a key on your keyboard will control a certain parameter. Again, these principles will be described in further detail further on in the course. Okay, let's move on to the next section, which is modulation types. I've gone through this already, with one exception, the modulation controller. Now what this, this actually means is if I show you the modulation wheel controlling the filter cutoff, that means that the modulation wheel is a modulation source, which I've already pretty much explained, but I can show you that again. If we just come in here, modulation wheel. Now, let me just change the, uh, the envelope so we've got some. Okay, now if I bend the modulation wheel. Okay, to show you the modulation wheel, which is an external modulation source, controlling the filter cutoff, right click, latch to MIDI, move the modulation wheel, and it's the same with the pitch bend. Now if I press a key on the keyboard, and move the modulation wheel up, Now, doing that, using the modulation wheel to control the filter cutoff means that the modulation wheel is a modulation source. It's the source of the modulation, i.e. the filter cutoff being ramped up and down. Now, if we use the modulation wheel to control the LFO depth, which in turn controls the filter cutoff, that makes the modulation wheel a modulation controller. This is the distinction. So the modulation source directly affects the sound, 
So the modulation wheel controls the filter cutoff. Whereas the modulation wheel, if it's assigned to control the LFO depth, which in turn controls the filter cutoff, it's a modulation controller. Again, this stuff will be in more depth later on. So now, if I use the modulation wheel to control the speed of the LFO, which in turn controls the filter cutoff, the modulation wheel is then known as a modulation controller. And just to give you an example of that, I've set up the LFO here to control the filter cutoff frequency. And if I use the modulation wheel, you'll see this change. Okay? So that's it off. If I press a key, then start, then start moving the modulation wheel, you'll hear what happens. So as you can see, the modulation wheel itself isn't actually affecting the sound source, but it is affecting a parameter which is affecting that. So that's the distinction between the modulation being a sound source. It's a sound source when it does this. It's a sound controller when it does this modulation controller. So. Okay, I know that section was a, a little bit complicated, but I just thought it would be something worthwhile knowing. Now we'll move on to the next section, which is a brief description of some other modulation sources that you can have. Velocity is one I've already explained. Velocity is directly related to how hard you hit a key on your keyboard. I can show you that in Cubase easy enough. So in Cubase, we've got Predator here. If I just play in some notes and record them, if we double click that, what we have here is the MIDI part that I've drawn in. As you can see, we've got the velocity lane here and all the velocities are equal at the moment. So if you listen. Now if I change the velocities, Listen now. Now that's showing you that the velocity is set to the amplitude. Um, so now if I just delete that and now play something in with different pressures on the notes of the keyboard, watch what happens. As you can see, all the different velocities are taken into consideration. So velocity can also be used to control many other things. But again, that will be explained in more detail further on in the course. Another modulation source I want to show you is the next Y controller. Basically, looks something like this. And an XY controller can be controlled by one or two parameters, depending on what kind of controller you've got for it. For instance, I have a MIDI keyboard that has an XY controller on it, which is a pad that looks pretty much like this, that I can put my finger on anywhere and move, and it will control whatever's been assigned to the X and the Y axis. In this case, the cutoff and the resonance has been assigned to the X and Y axis. So if I use this and move my hand on my XY controller, Great, can, great way of controlling two parameters at once. Really, that really does give you a lot of freedom. And it can also be you can also assign them individually. If I right click on this and I put MIDI Learn X Axis and turn a knob on my MIDI controller, that's assigned to the X Axis. Right click on this one, MIDI Learn Y Axis, and move a fader. There we go. So now if I press play. So as you can see, really useful and great fun. 
Okay, the next modulation source I want to um, point out to you is called aftertouch. Aftertouch is a difficult one to show you, but I can explain it to you and I can let you hear it. Basically, when you push a key on a keyboard and you push that note, all that that key all the way down, there is a certain part of that downward motion when it gets to the full bottom that you can push again. It's it, the the key's got a little. Just a small part of give, it moves just a little bit. That's called aftertouch, and aftertouch can be assigned to all kinds of things. But you will hear it on things like violins and strings to create vibrato, to make it go wo 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 And I can demonstrate it on this string sound, if you just listen. First without aftertouch, second with aftertouch. This time with aftertouch. So you can hear it modulating. That's what aftertouch is doing. I've aftertouch is adding that extra level of expression. That's great for real sounding instruments because you can add the breath, the, the extra expression, the vibrato that makes a stationary note move up and down in very quick succession. Uh, that's a, it's a difficult one to explain that, so I won't go into it at the moment, but we will explain it in more detail in the future. Another controller I'd like to talk about briefly is MIDI CC numbers. MIDI CC numbers, or MIDI continuous controllers, are a set of 128 numbers from 0 to 127 that can be used to assign to any parameter. I'm not going to go into this very deeply here because it can get pretty complicated. There are a set of uh, MIDI CC numbers that are pre-assigned. For instance, MIDI CC number 0 is bank select, 1 is modulation wheel, 2 is breath control, so on and so forth. But basically, any of those can be reassigned. For instance, if I right-click on this, hit MIDI learn and move the modulation wheel, I've just reassigned MIDI control number 1 to the cutoff. Now, depending on your MIDI controller, you will know what number each of your knobs on and your faders on your controller are assigned to. But they can all be reassigned. Um, so it's something I'll go into later in a bit more depth. I just wanted to make you aware of it. The last one, or the last kind of MIDI modulation controller I want to go into is key tracking, also known as key follow. Is again, can be rather complicated. Um, to understand it first, so it's only a brief kind of overview of it here, but basically what it allows you to do is, in the, in the instance of a filter, if I press, if I keep key follow down and press C, and then go up an octave, and then another, up another octave, that's fine, you can hear that it's moving up an octave. Now if I open key follow right up, the higher the notes that I play, the more the filter cutoff is going to be opened. So... So you can hear that the cutoff is open loads because I've turned it right up, but if we be a bit more gentle with it... So as you can hear, the higher the key follow or key tracking is open, the more cutoffs being let through. Will be explained in more detail. It's just something I wanted you to be aware of as a modulation source. Okay, let's move on to the next section, which is some general points that you need to be aware of for the course. I'm using Steinberg Cubase 5.1 when creating downs, showing you some principles of synthesis. In the basic section of the course, the three synthesizers I'm using is Yuhi's Zebra 2, and it's version 2.3.1. There are beta versions that are higher up than this, but if you're using them, you will need to um, keep in mind that I'm using the 2.3.1 because there are differences. I'm using Native Instruments Reactor 5, both in standalone and in its VST versions. I will make you aware which is which when using it, but obviously the VST version will be opened up in Cubase. 
and I'm also using the most up-to-date version at this moment of Rob Paben's Predator, which is 1.5.6b. Um, I have also supplied all the patches and the presets that I create with these synths. And if there's any empty patches that you may need, they'll be supplied also. Okay, I think a few things I want to explain about the synths that I'm using in this, the basic section. The Rob Paben synthesizer is what's known as a fixed architecture synth. The reason this is a fixed architecture synth is very simple. It basically means that there's three oscillators, a filter, two filters, sorry, a filter LFO, an amp, effects and whatever else. But everything you see here can't be removed and can't be added to. I can't add a fourth oscillator. I can't take away the second filter. I can turn them off and I don't have to use all the oscillators. I can use one, two or three, but I can't use four. And I can't add a third filter or add any more effects than are already available or anything else. So fixed architecture synth simply means that what you see is what you get. That's the tools you've got to work with and that's it. The next synth is the Yuhi Zebra 2, which is a wireless modular synth. This is Yuhi Zebra 2 here, and the reason it's known as a wireless modular synth is one, there's no wires to connect, and two, the word modular means that you can add and take away at will. So for instance, at the moment I've got one oscillator and one filter. If I wanted to add another oscillator, I just click here, and there it is, and it shows up here. If I want to add another filter, all I need to do is click here and select filter 2 and we've got two filters. I can also double click and turn them off or I can right click and remove. But as you can see I don't have to connect any wires to connect these tools. They're instantly there. Oscillator 1, there it is. Filter, there it is. Mixer, there it is. Ring modulator or an XMF. Filter, there it is, but there's no wires to connect. The third one, which is a wired modular synth, is Native Instruments Reactor 5. Okay, this is what the synth looks like that we build in Reactor 5. This is a wireless, a wired modular. And the reason we call it a wired modular is if I double click on this, you will see that to build the synth itself, you need to connect these wires. Now, to show you that, for instance, if I want to connect if I want to connect this note pitch to this ADSR envelope, I need to left click on its output and collect it to its pitch input. As you can see, I have to create wires. It's modular because you can add as much as you like, I can add other oscillators, filters, delays, whatever it is that I want. So modular means you can add and take away as much as you like. This is a wired modular because you need to use wires to join them together. Zebra 2 is wireless because there's no wires to add. It's modular because you can remove and add whatever you like. Predator is a fixed architecture because what you start off with is what you've got. You can't have any less or any more than this. So that's it. That's a brief description of the three types of synths that we'll be using in the basic section. <clears throat> and finally, just some user considerations. Just some things that you need to be aware of when watching and following this course. Depending on your setup, some frequencies that I create during the creation of the sounds you might not be able to hear. Now, one thing you've got to take into consideration, I'm using professional high-end monitors, I'm using professional microphones, and a semi-professional setup with regards to PC and, and the room that I'm in. Um, now, if you're listening to this on laptop speakers, or even small desktop speakers to a certain degree, there's a good chance that you won't hear any of the low-end bass simply because those speakers just cannot recreate the bass I'm creating. So this is something that you must take into consideration when watching the course. Laptop speakers and small desktop speakers, they're, they're just no substitute for a professional monitoring system. I'm not saying that to enjoy this course you need to go out and spend a thousand pounds on monitors, but what I'm saying is, if you're watching the video and I'm telling you that there's some sound 
that's being created and you can't hear it, if you're listening to this course through laptop speakers or small desktop speakers, then that may be the problem. If this is the case and you are listening through laptop speakers or small desktop speakers and you are having problems, get yourself a half decent set of headphones. They don't cost the earth and they will allow you to hear some of the low frequencies being created. You don't have to spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds on this stuff. However, to be perfectly honest with you, if you are serious about music production, one thing you should be spending quite a good bit of money on is decent monitors. Because without them, you're not going to really be able to recreate the level of accuracy required for good, top-end, crystal clear music. Saying that, make the most of what you've got, enjoy the course, um, I hope this little introduction hasn't been too complicated. I tried to keep it as uncomplicated as possible, but I understand that some of the some of the principles that I've explained may just seem a bit scary or overwhelming. But believe me when I say the rest of the course will break this down to such a level that even if you're a complete novice and you've never touched any of this stuff before, by the end of the course you will understand every principle that's been spoken of in this introductory section and a whole lot more to such uh, to a much much deeper fundamental understanding that maybe you surprise yourself and hopefully you'll be able to create though all those great sounds that you can hear inside your own head so thanks for watching this first video and now go on and get on with the other videos and enjoy yourself